Hey everyone, it's Tim from Linnelsa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. So it's mid-April in Indiana and that means it's winter time again. Apparently we have snow on the way. It is freezing cold outside and the wind's blowing about 30 miles an hour. So I figured today would be a good day to bring it into the shop and talk about overall health assessments. Now I've broken this down into what I like to call the ABCs of health assessment. And if you follow these rules, this is going to help you very, very much to identify and treat any sick animals on your farm. Stay tuned to find out more. Thanks again for joining us today. If you would like to learn more, if you'd like to be in the know a little bit more than you already are, make sure to check us out at the following places. You can go to www.lanessafarms.com. You can email us at customerservice.lanessafarms.com and you can check out what's going on on our farm at Facebook by doing a search for Lanessa Farms LLC. And we have a very special group that we just started about a month ago. It's kind of like a question and answer forum, and it's a place for all of our viewers to come together to learn more. And that is called Lanessa Farms Tack Box. So go to Facebook, look at groups, and look at Lanessa Farms Tack Box. Also, we have lots of free stuff available. We have stickers, we have pens, we have all kinds of cool stuff. So if you send us an email, with your name and address and all you got to do is in the subject line just put free stuff and then all you got to do is put your uh, name and address and we will mail you out some free stuff and it won't cost you a penny so with that being said let's get going into the video so here we are talking about overall health assessment and as you can tell i've actually changed things up a little bit um, I'm going to actually write on the board and then start videotaping. That way you don't have to watch me write on the board. Um, and it gives me a little bit more time to talk about things and elaborate on things. So today we're going to talk about the ABCs of health assessment and treatment. Um, and this is what we're looking at. A stands for assessment. Generally speaking, this is going to be looking at the animal and trying to determine if we can determine what's wrong. B is the, the big question, the because. We figure out what's wrong with them and now we want to see if we can figure out what's causing this to happen. And C stands for culling and confinement. Two very important considerations when dealing with sick or generally unhealthy animals. And so we're going to wrap it up with talking about that. So with that being said, and with a little bit of video magic, let's switch over to assessment and see what we have to learn there. All right, so here we are in the assessment area. Uh, our first one, again, this is what A stands for, is assessment. So what do we mean when we say assessment? Well, essentially with assessment, we're saying, what are the symptoms? When you go out there and you're looking at your animal or your animals, and you notice that something's not quite right about them, the first thing you wanna do is take a notebook or take something with you, and I want you to start writing down things that you notice about that animal um, to keep in mind that tells you Okay, something's not right here. The most common symptoms that you're going to see in an animal that's not feeling well or that has something going on with them is that they're not eating or drinking. Uh, hunger and thirst are some of the first signs and symptoms uh, that something is not right. Um, the second most common one that you're gonna notice more than likely is gonna be off by themselves. Um, they're not gonna wanna be around anybody um, and they're going to be kind of hanging out by themselves and and you know this even happens in cases of like when uh, moms are getting ready to have babies or when they're uh, getting getting very far along um, in pregnancy weakness and slowness so weakness and slowness uh, these are uh, some things that you'll notice most when animals get up from uh, sitting down or laying down um, if we're talking about having a hard time getting up um, maybe it seems like the back end isn't working as well as the front end, um, things of that nature. These are very important to watch for as well. Sores around the mouth, nose, and eyes. So when we talk about sores around the mouth, we are generally talking about sore mouth, but if you start noticing that you're missing some hair and there's some sores in other places like around the nose and around the eyes, you may be looking at something away from sore mouth and you may be looking at something um, more in the area of uh, mange. Loss of wool or hair. Now this can be general or specific. So when we talk about a loss of wool or hair, 
Um, this can be anywhere on the body. You notice that they're missing uh, patches of wool or patches of hair, or on the males, they may be missing patches of wool or hair on the scrotum, uh, on the back of the front legs. If they're missing on the scrotum on the back of the front legs, that's generally a sign that we're dealing with mange. If they're missing it in parts that they can't probably reach, that means we may have some wool biting going on with other animals, um, or they may have mange or something where they're scratching it off. And then there's just general stress. Um, and you will see this on some moms when they have babies on them for a very long time as we're getting to the end of our uh, cycle where we're getting ready to wean that it's so much stress on the mom that um, they actually start to lose hair or lose wool. Bottle jaw and pale eyelids. Bottle jaw is kind of the last sign and symptom of a serious parasite infestation. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to explain and we get into the deep weeds of osmosis and some other things when we talk about that third spacing and why fluid is collecting in the jaw itself. But just know that bottle jaw, pale eyelids, we're, we're talking about primarily, we're talking about a worm or parasite issue. Straining to urinate, this is another big one that you may notice. When we talk about straining to urinate, you're gonna see this especially in your males. Uh, they may have what's called renal colic. They may be arching up in their back and look like they're pushing really hard in order to try to urinate, but no urine's coming out. Or you notice it's just a fine dribble uh, and then they can't urinate any after that. So in that case, we're talking about urinary calculi. And then finally, uh, scours. When we talk about scours, um, we're talking about diarrhea. And it's important for you to note the color and the smell, um, especially if you're gonna be telling your veterinarian about this. Uh, color, if we get into a bacterial infection like E. coli, um, we start thinking we're gonna see like bright green colors, loose green colors. If we are getting into black tarry colored stools, uh, then we think potentially GI bleeds, things of that nature. If we're getting into the clear or bloody stool, then we start thinking maybe more in the, in the realm of uh, coccidiosis. The other two big giveaways uh, that you're going to see um, with your assessment is going to be your overall body condition, Okay, you know, do they just look bad? Are they very, very emaciated? Do they look very thin? Um, do they look unhealthy? Body condition is, is a dead giveaway that's often going to be associated um, with some of these other things during your general assessment. And the absolute must, you absolutely, if you do one thing, I want you to do this, and I want you to take their temperature. You must, must, must take their temperature when you're doing your assessment. If you don't have a thermometer, you absolutely, positively must go out and get one. This is, if, if you listen to anything that I tell you in this entire video, pay attention to body temperature, keep up to speed on that. When you are doing your assessment on your animals, you absolutely must determine if they are running a temperature. A temperature on a sheep, um, if you wanna stay in the healthy range, we're gonna get up to 103.8. You start getting above 103.8, 103.5, um, you're starting to run a temp. They can run anywhere from about 101 uh, to mid 103s comfortably, depending on the time of year and what's going on. But you start going north of 103.8 and you more than likely have a serious infection going on that you need to deal with. With that being said, let's move on to the because side of the coin and see what we have to learn there. All right, so here we're getting into the B, the because. So we've done our assessment and we're seeing what these signs and symptoms are. Um, and now we want to figure out, okay, what is driving um, these common uh, signs and symptoms? Um, the very first thing that I want to talk about is babies. You know, here in Indiana, we're getting ready to pull a lot of our babies off of our moms. And uh, we're getting towards that weaning time and moms are looking rough. Um, this is a normal degenerative kind of cascade that happens when uh, we have large lamb twins that are on a mom. We've got some moms that are, are carrying around or to say feeding uh, babies that weigh as much as they do uh, combined. So I've got moms with 70 pound lambs on them. Um, you know, trying to breastfeed two 70 pound lambs uh, will most definitely lead to things like weight loss and vitamin deficiencies. Uh, which can, the, that weight loss and vitamin deficiency can lead to some of those other signs and symptoms that we we're talking about, like weakness, 
um, inability to get up, going off of feed, things like that. Uh, bullied. Bullied is another important one to consider. You know, we've got our littles and we've got our bigs on it, on our farms. And it's a general rule of thumb that our bigs get bigger and our littles get littler, as we like to joke, um, especially for those farms that don't sort out their animals. Um, your big animals are going to be rough with your little ones. They're going to push them out of the way um, so they can get the uh, get the most feed and nutrition that they can get and what you'll find is sometimes the little ones will be a little bit shy or a little bit more meek and they will actually just kind of stand back and let the big ones eat and kind of go in and try to clean up the crumbs after uh, after it's all said and done and they just kind of get left behind and they don't get a good uh, amount of nutrition um, they run off the feed deficiency vitamin deficiency and also you might want to look for injuries uh, because it's not uncommon that you know they're getting rammed they're getting hit they're getting hurt um, and this is something that's very important to watch for, especially with show animals and with pregnant ewes. You know, you don't want a pregnant ewe ramming another ewe, uh, another pregnant ewe in the, in the gut or anything like that or fighting. Obviously, poor nutrition kind of speaks for itself. Um, it is not as, it's not as important how much you feed, but what you feed. Um, lack of water, this can lead to acidosis and dehydration. Again, we've talked about this in, in some of our videos about the acidosis and how the rumen needs enough fluid to keep that pH um, up and out of the acidic area um, to make sure that the animal uh, doesn't burn up their rumen. No shelter, you know, these sheep and goats need shelter just as much when it's really hot as they do when it's really cold. Uh, heat stress is a huge issue, especially for sheep that are still under a wool coat. And of course, hypothermia is something you should think about as well. Do they have a parasite load? We talked about this in a recent video. Um, you know, you need to get out of the thought process of saying, well, it's worms when it's parasites. It can be lots of things. It can be mange. Um, it can be a variety of different worms, can be ticks, um, can be lice, lots of different things that you need to consider when it comes to parasite load. Uh, poisoning, this is an important one that I want you to consider because you'll notice I put poisoning and bloat together. Just because a plant is not inherently poisonous, that is to say, uh, take uh, clover, for example. Clover itself is not poisonous. However, um, if you cut an animal loose on a pasture that has lots and lots of clover on it, chances are they're going to get bloat and the bloat can most definitely potentially kill them. So when you're looking at them and you're trying to determine, okay, are they poison? Uh, things to look for is going to be like frothing at the mouth, um, big and bloated, not able to get up off of the ground, um, staggering walk like they're drunk. Um, and this can come in the shade of uh, the legumes, which we talked about, which is like a lot of clover, a lot of alfalfa, um, nightshade family of plants. Uh, can be poisonous as well. And then certain times of the year, you've got to watch out for arsenic poisoning as well. Um, if you have things like cherry trees, uh, things like that, them eating the leaves directly off of a cherry tree isn't going to poison them. But if, God forbid, you had a branch fall off or something like that, and then they start eating the leaves off of that damaged branch, uh, they can, in fact, get arsenic poisoning. So something to keep in mind. And then, of course, our urinary calculi. And we already talked about that before. And that kind of falls into that nutritional uh, spectrum that we've talked about many, many times in the past, which is, you know, calcium phosphorus imbalance, which is more than likely what's driving the urinary calculi. And I know I said that B stood for because, but when you have that B, I want you to also remember this B word and it is bacteria. And bacteria is what comes into play when we have an increased uh, body temperature. And this is, is so important um, because this is essentially, uh, these two go together. You have an increased body temp, chances are you've got a bacterial infection, sometimes viral, but mostly bacterial. Um, and this is going to determine your entire course of treatment. And it's going to determine, uh, most importantly, if or if not you put that animal on antibiotic therapy. All right, so I gotta be honest with you, you know, it should have been the ABTC method, but it just doesn't sound as good. So we're on the next step here. We've done our assessment, we figured out, or at least we think we figured out the because, and now we're gonna get into the treatment uh, realm of things. And what you're gonna notice is 
there's not like a set A, B, T, C. You're not gonna do these steps. Like you may have to move back and forth between steps. You may have to reassess as you're going along. You may have to try to figure out a because. Every time you reassess, you're gonna have to try to figure out a because. And then when you start talking about treatments, you may have to you know, kind of bounce all over the place. But this is the general, most logical way to treat you or to tell you about how to treat animals. Now listen, I'm not a veterinarian. Um, so what I am telling you today, uh, I want you to consider doing at your own risk. Even if you can just make it through the A's and the B's, call your veterinarian and say, hey, this is what I've got and this is what I've got going on. You are gonna save yourself a ton of time and a ton of money. But let's assume that you're going to move forward on your own because I know a lot of you don't even have vets in your area. Um, again, you need to do so at your own risk and some of the meds that you need, you're gonna end up having to go through a vet. So in the treatment phase, again, we wanna say, okay, do I have a temperature? Um, if you have a temperature, an increased body temperature, yes. So at this point, we're assuming that this is bacteria or maybe virus driven, but more than likely, um, it's gonna be bacterial driven, some kind of an infection going on. The answer is yes. In this case, the general rule of thumb is you wanna start on your antibiotic therapy. And again, this is gonna be very dependent on what kind of infection you have. Um, this could be LA200, this could be Nuflor, this could be penicillin. Um, it's, it's difficult to say without knowing exactly what it is that you're dealing with. Um, vitamin therapy is usually associated with this. Uh, B vitamins um, always help out the animal um, anytime they're down and they've got other things going on. Remember, this is going to be a cascade. Rarely are you going to have a bacterial infection and you're not going to have an animal that's off feed or have an animal that's down and not wanting to get back up. You know, a lot of this stuff is going to go together. And you're going to notice a, a common thread here with the vitamin B therapy uh, between all of them. And that's, that's not a coincidence. Um, I won't uh, say the vet's name, but a veterinarian that I know, very, very wise fellow. Um, I have asked him once, I said, what do you do when you go out to a farm and, and you see an animal that you just don't know what's wrong with them? And he said, you know, um, I treat them with antibiotics, anti-inflammatory medications, and vitamin B. Um, and I just hit them with all of them and we hope for the best. Because the reality is, is you're not going to be able to treat every animal all the time. Uh, you're not gonna be able to find out what's wrong with every animal all the time. And antibiotics, anti-inflammatory, and vitamin B therapy goes a very long way in treating all kinds of illnesses. Um, pain meds, so we have pain medications like banamine. And banamine actually has two uh, beneficial roles. It's a antipyretic, which just means that it helps to control body temperature. Just like those of you at home, you know, when you have a bad temp, you may take Tylenol or Motrin. Um, the pain meds like banamine can help pull down a fever as well. Um, fevers aren't necessarily too bad, even in humans. Uh, now I'm getting into people medicine, but you know, a little temperature is not too bad. A lot of temperature is. Um, so just something to keep in mind, but this would be something to expect to see from your veterinarian. Antibiotic therapy, vitamin B therapy, possible anti-inflammatory medications, and pain medications. And this is why I start getting into, you know, talking to you about, hey, you need to make sure you utilize your vet because there's certain uh, things that can happen with medications like this. For example, you know, if you had a pregnant you, giving her anti-inflammatory medications can cause her to go into early labor. Um, if you have a you that has babies on her or a doe that has babies on her, um, things like certain vitamin therapies, certain anti-inflammatory uh, medications or certain um, antibiotics can actually cause her milk production to drop off. So again, there's a lot of ins and outs. This is just a general uh, knowledge base uh, coverage for you. So this is if we have a temperature. If you don't have a temperature, do you have pale eyelids? If you do have pale eyelids and no temperature, we're gonna treat for parasites. Um, again, we know what to do for parasites. Um, could be a warmer, could be an injection, could be a pour on. It would depend on, again, we gotta go back to that, we gotta go back to that B, the, the because why. Well, is it because they have lice? Is it because um, they have worms? Is it because they have mange? We don't know, and that will determine which one of these that we give. And again, we're seeing that vitamin B therapy uh, rear its head. 
because again, it's important and it does a lot for them. If we don't have pale eyelids and we don't have a temperature, we're left kind of to our own devices to see if we can treat the signs and symptoms of what exactly is going on. Now this, can, this falls into the all other category. Um, is the animal suffering from something like uh, goat or lamb polio, um, white muscle disease? Um, do they have some kind of underlying genetic deficiencies like spider um, or perhaps CL, something like that? So, you know, this really opens up the door to a ton of stuff. This is kind of the catch all. And so you're going to do your best to treat the signs and symptoms. Uh, Anti inflammatory medications, vitamin therapy. Uh, acidosis medications, if, if the veterinarian determines that, you know, the animal ha is having issues with its rumen, maybe it's spilling its cud, barfing up green stuff, um, that would be a, a case where you might want to use acidosis medication. Bloat meds, I think everyone should keep some kind of bloat medication on their farm, be it uh, TheraBloat or some kind of uh, bloat preventative. Uh, if they're foaming at the mouth, if they're down and have a huge abdomen and they can't get back up, that would be an example of bloat medications. Pain medications, maybe they've twisted their, their hock or uh, they've hurt their hip or something like that or they've got a nasty cut. Um, that would be an example of putting an animal on pain meds. And then, of course, our scour medications, which again, if they're having scours, we got to go back to that because and we got to determine what kind of scours they're having. Um, if they're having E. coli, type of scours, then we can reach for our spectam. If they're having coccidiosis type uh, ones, we can give them very specific coccidiosis medications like Corid, um, uh, Sulfa in some cases for scours. Um, and then it may just be that they've gotten into the feed and they have an upset stomach and you may be able to treat them with something like Kaopectate or Pepto-Bismol. Um, or you may be calling your vet and your vet may say they want you to give them something completely different. So again, treatment wise, uh, this, is, this is where we're getting really, really complex and really into the deep weeds of, um, of what it is that we do in, in medicine uh, when it comes to animals. So one last point that I wanna make before I let you go and we'll get to that right now. So this is the last part. This is our C part where we talk about confinement and culling. When it comes to confinement, I just want you to remember anytime that you're treating a sick animal, I want you to confine them. This is common sense, but I wanted to cover it with you. This allows us to protect the animal from other animals, possibly pushing it out of the way, preventing it from getting uh, the food and rest that it needs. It protects others. In case your animal has something that's contagious, um, like sore mouth, hoof rot, um, you know, E. coli, things like that. Um, we want you to protect others. And then we want you to monitor and treat um, the animal. And it's much easier to do that when the animal's in confinement. When we talk about culling, culling we're talking about getting rid of the animal. Only get rid of an animal, only sell if healthy. Don't be that guy or that gal that sells a animal to someone else if they're not healthy um, or tries to pull a fast one on someone. And obviously we don't want you eating any animals that are unhealthy and we don't know why either. Um, the note about culling, you know, sometimes, you know, on a farm like mine where I have 20, 30 animals, one animal may get pushed out because maybe they're a different breed um, and they require different nutrition or maybe they're a little bit meek and a little bit weak. And if that's the case, you know, we can, we've sold, a sheep before uh, that didn't do good with a lot of other sheep to a farm that maybe has one or two and they do fantastic. Uh, same thing with goats, you know, maybe you've got a pygmy goat farm, um, but then you bring a boar goat in and they beat the snot out of everybody. So something definitely to keep in mind, but again, responsibility, ethics goes a long way. Um, treat other people how you would want to be treated and, and miracles will happen for everybody. So that is it. I know I gave you a lot of information. Uh, hopefully it was helpful to you. I love what I do. I love talking to you guys and giving you information and helping you out. Um, please give us a thumbs up and a like and make sure you comment below. If you have questions, make sure you let us know. And I look forward to seeing you again next time.